first song tonight is This is the Day, and it's, this is Wednesday, and this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And sing with me. songs never grow old, do they? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's wonderful to be alive and it's wonderful to be in God's house tonight to worship him. It's good to see you here this evening. Thank you so much for coming. I see a big sigh of relief on a lot of parents' faces tonight. Kids are back in school. How about that? But the only trade-off on that is traffic. And the traffic is a whole lot worse now with all, I believe every kid in school has a car to drive. And then you add buses to that, boy, it really clogs the highways. We're well, glad you made it to church tonight. I would that everybody would want to go to church like they go everywhere else. But uh, there's going to come a day when everybody's going to wish they had gone to church. They're going to wish they had, but I'm glad we're here tonight to worship the Lord. Let's continue to pray for the folks that are sick, not able to be here. Pray God will touch them. Understand Sister Barbara is not feeling well tonight. Pray God will touch her. We continue to pray for Sister Anita and uh, also for a special unspoken request that someone gave you tonight. Do you have any unspoken request but lift of hand? Let's believe the Lord for these tonight. Pray for this service that God would move in a mighty way. Our Father, we thank you tonight once again for blessing us to come together in your house. We give you thanksgiving. We give you praise for the blessings you've given to us already this week. For your presence we have felt, for the anointing, O oh God, that's been upon us as we've overcome the enemy, as we live triumphantly and victoriously day by day, walking by faith and trusting in you. Lord, tonight we pray that we'll hear from heaven, that your word will stir our hearts, that the songs that are sung will lift us up in our spirit, and Lord, that above all we'll bring glory and honor and praise to your name. We ask you to touch all these tonight that are sick and afflicted, every name that's called and every hand that's been extended representing a need. We know, Lord, you're able tonight to bring healing to sick bodies and deliverance to those who are bound and oppressed of the devil. We have, have, Lord, tonight thanksgiving unto you and believe you for the souls that are lost that they might be saved. For we know there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray and ask it all. Amen. And amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God? We're delighted to have you with us tonight. I will rejoice, I will 
will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day.
Is he all that you need tonight? I pray that he is. Because Jesus Christ is everything. And I know, and I can tell you truthfully, that Jesus Christ is near to each one of us. Reading from Psalms chapter 27, 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall thy dwell in the land, verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. I picked a few words out of here that I think really, they kind of describe the instructions that God wants us to do. First of all, he says trust. Do you trust in Jesus Christ? You know, there's a lot of people that's trusted in everything except Jesus Christ. And you know, and then he tells us, and he says, do good. You know, if anybody ought to do good, it's God's people, God's disciples, God's ambassadors. And then he says, delight in the Lord. Do you delight in the Lord? Or are you delighting in some, something else that will not let you get into the portals of glory? And then it says, commit. I pray tonight that each one of us will rededicate, reconcentrate, take inventory, and commit our lives fully to Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we need to do this because we draw slack. But I believe if we do all of these, then we're not going to have one little problem of giving in the offering and paying our tithes because Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity, God, to come together to worship you. God, you're so good to us, God. God, there's no possible way we could ever pay you for what you've already done. And God, we thank you, God, for our brothers and sisters in the Matthews Church of God. And God, we just pray that you'd open up the windows of heaven and pour out them blessings that they could never imagine. Because you see, we're serving a God a God that loves each one of us here tonight, a God that can take care of our needs to protect us and to supply our need tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd bless this offering, God, tonight. 
God, that you would use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom, that you'd multiply it many times over, that the obligations of the Matthews Church of God can be met, that we might minister to others in the name of Jesus. glad my life is in his hands we used to sing the whole world is in his hands but that makes it personal I'm in his hands my times are in his hands his hand is upon me his arm is not too short that he cannot save his ear is not too heavy that he cannot hear he is a big God he is a mighty God tonight the government is upon his shoulders he can handle it he can handle whatever is dealing with you whatever you're going through he is 
mighty and great and great to be praised. And we praise him tonight for his presence. I already feel better since being here tonight. I'm glad I came to church. Praise God. I'm glad to be in God's house. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stand for the reading of the scripture reading tonight from the book of Joshua. I read from Joshua Sunday night. So again, tonight, reading from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. I want to speak on that subject tonight, why the manna stopped. Would you pray with me and ask the Lord's anointing tonight? Father, we thank you once again for your wonderful presence we have felt here tonight, for the singers and musicians and the songs. Thank you, Lord, tonight that we can gather together and know that you're in the midst of your church and among your people. We know, Lord, tonight you know every burden, every care, and every problem. We pray tonight that you would speak to us, that you would help us to hear from heaven, to hear your voice, to hear your instruction, your directives, and your guidance to know your plan, your will, your purpose for each of our lives. We ask you, Lord, to bless the church tonight. Surround us, Lord, with your holy presence and power. Renew our might. Renew our strength. And help us, Lord, tonight leave this service rejoicing in you for your wonderful fellowship, your wonderful love, and wonderful grace we have felt. We give you thanksgiving now for all you've done, for what you're doing, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. For 40 years, Israel woke up every morning with manna in the camp as they traveled to, to the promised land, to Canaan land. Now, the word manna literally means what is it or what is this? There was really no description. They'd never seen anything like this before. So when they saw it, they said, what is this or what is it? So it got its name from that. Exodus 16, 31, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Manna was very unique. It was small in its appearance. It was like a small wafer. It was round. It was white. It was sweet. Reminded them of the word of God. He says in Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How many of you know tonight the word of God is sweet? The word of God is good for us, strengthens us. It's nourishing. That's what the manna was. It was very nourishing. In fact, it came down from heaven. Anything that comes down from heaven is going to be nourishing. And it came down on the dew in the night. Numbers 11, 9 said, And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So the dew was sort of like a tablecloth in the wilderness that the, the manna would land upon, that it would be uh, descend upon, and, and it would uh, fall upon this dew, and the people would find it there in the morning time. But the manna was very perishable. It would quickly perish away. So they were instructed, don't hoard it up. Don't hoard it up as though you're not going to have anything tomorrow. Because if they hoarded it up, they found out a terrible thing. It began to stink and it had maggots in it. So they learned very quickly, you don't want to hoard up this manna. But on the day before the Sabbath, God would give them a double portion. He would give them extra because there would be no manna to fall on the Sabbath day. So every day for 40 years, God provided them manna from heaven. There was nothing on earth like this. 
They had never seen anything like it before. In Psalm 78, 25, it said, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. The psalmist calls it angels' food. What is this? What, what is this stuff? The psalmist said it's angels' food. It could have been that the angels prepared the food. It could have been the angels delivered the food. And it could be that angels feasted on this manna. But he called it angels' food. It was a delicacy. It had this wonderful taste, the taste of honey. It was so nutritious that it sustained Israel for 40 years. Elijah survived uh, for 40 days on a cake that was baked by an angel. Deuteronomy 34, 7 said in Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Must have been much better than this protein shakes that they have today or these nutri nutritious bars that they have, these, these uh, bars that are supposed to be packed with vitamins and, and miracles with minerals, but this was a miracle food. This was a special food that came down from heaven. And according to today's calculations, Israel gathered about 9 million pounds of manna every day. That would equal 300 boxcar loads of manna. Isn't God good? No wonder the psalmist said he loads me up with benefits. But the manna was temporary. The manna was for a certain period of time. And the day came when the manna stopped. Verse 12, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna anymore. Now there was a generation of Israel that was born in the wilderness. They were born, that's all that they knew. They knew nothing of agriculture. They didn't know anything about growing crops. It was a generation that thought like most young people today that food comes from grocery stores. They think that's where they come from, that it doesn't come from anywhere else. But this food came from heaven. This food wasn't delivered by Grubhub or by the DoorDash crowd, but it was delivered by angels. God has angels that he dispatches, that carries out his will and carries out his purposes. And angels delivered this food. This manna was baked in heaven's bake shop and the angels brought it to the door of their tents. God is a provider. God is a supplier. He's able to meet every need that we have. But this was the greatest prolonged miracle in history, in human history. You don't read about anything before this and you don't read about anything after this. This was a miracle that lasted for 40 years. So it had to come as a shock when everybody got up one morning and they went out of their tents, but there was no manna. They went out and they looked everywhere, but what they had been seeing for 40 years did not appear. It must have shocked them. They must have wondered what happened. What terrible sin have we committed that God would stop the manna, that he would not send us the manna anymore, but God always has a plan. God always has a purpose in what he does. The desert was barren. It was uncultivated land. Nothing could grow there in Israel. They, they were under this special care, the protective, of, protective care of God on their journey for 40 years. But God always provide. His name is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. He will supply. He will meet the needs that we have. The apostle Paul said, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He caused water to come gushing out of a rock. He caused birds to feed his prophet. He caused loaves and fish to multiply, to feed the multitude. So the soil of Canaan was rich soil. It was fertile soil. It was land that the Bible described as flowing with milk and honey. It was a glorious place, a, a wonderful place to be. There was no longer any need 
for the manna in Canaan land. They could produce their own food. They could grow their own crops. They could have their own vineyards. So God stopped the manna to help Israel to mature and to move on to what he had for them. The manna stopped because God expected them to work. The manna stopped because God had a plan and a purpose for them to do their part, to do what they could do. They couldn't grow any crops in the desert. They couldn't grow their own food in the wilderness, so God took care of that. But now they were in a land where they could grow crops. Now they were in a land where they could produce a harvest. So here the Lord stopped the manna. You've seen the signs in the restaurants that say no shirt, no shoes, no service. Well, the New Testament had a saying similar to that. The New Testament sign would have read no work, no food. If you don't work, you're not going to have any food. Second Thessalonians 3.10, if any would not work, neither should he eat. If you don't work, then you don't sit around and pray for a miracle. You don't sit around and pray you're going to win the lottery. You don't sit around and say, I hope somebody's going to do something good for me. He said, if you don't work, you don't eat. For in Proverbs 19.24, a slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Slothfulness was one of the original seven deadly sins. We ask God for help, and God will help us. The scripture said he is an ever-present help in trouble, but he expects us to do our part. We just can't sit back in the chair of sweet repose and say, God, give me. God, do this for me. God, wait on me. God, I need you to take care of this for me. He said, faith without works is dead. There has to be some work. There has to be some diligence. There has to be something we do on our part. If you lose your job, you pray for God to open a door for you to get another job. But while you're waiting for the door to open, you start filling out your resume. You start doing your part. Because when that door opens, you've got to be ready to walk through it. Because God can open a door that no man can close. He can make a way where there is no way. So you've got to be ready. You've got to do your part and you say God I'm praying I'm trusting and believing but I've got my shoes on I've girt about my loins and I'm ready to move I'm ready to march I'm ready to go I'm ready to do what I need to do to fulfill your will in my life before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead he told the people to roll away the stone now we all know that Jesus could have just spoke the word and the stone would have rolled away on its own accord. The people could not raise Lazarus from the dead, but they could roll away the stone. You see, God gets us involved in what he's doing. He doesn't just do it and lets us be spectators. He wants us to be involved in what he is doing. He wants us to do our part. He expects us to be involved in his miracles, involved in his work, involved in what he has to bring to pass. So God will give us the manna that we need to survive in the desert but we wouldn't be able to survive otherwise. We know that he's going to meet that need because there's no other way we would survive without it. But don't expect manna when you're living on fertile land. Don't expect God to pour out manna from heaven when you can produce, when you can do, when you can work yourself. God expects us to employ the laws of sowing and reaping. He's given us the law of agriculture and he said, you sow, you can reap. I've given to you to work by the sweat of your brow. This is what you need to do. But God stopped the manna to teach Israel that it was time to move from where they were. It was time for them to put their works with their faith. There comes a time when we have to move on from bottles and pacifiers. There comes a time when we have to move on from milk to meat. There comes a time when we put away childish things and we become a man or become a woman. There comes a time when we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There comes a time when we stand upon the word of God and we show ourselves the man or the woman of God he's called us to be. It's time to grow 
grow. It's time to mature. It's trying to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might to move on to the, what the Lord has for us to conquer and to overcome. The manna stopped the day after they ate food from the land of Canaan. The very next day, the manna stopped. If the brook dries up, God's already commanded a widow down at Zarephath to take care of his servant. The manna was specifically designed by heaven for the wilderness. A specific design. God has specific plans. Look at all the details. Look at all the meticulous things that God does. He is great. He's a great creator. And since they were moving from place to place, because they were in the wilderness, God provided the manna. But the manna was not permanent. It was not a permanent thing. We should, we should never get adjusted here. We should never get settled down here. It was only for the wilderness. Canaan was a totally different place from the desert. How refreshing it must have been to see all the foliage, to see the grass, to see all the beautiful fruits and all the wonderful vegetation. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of an, of an abundance. And Oh, when we all get to heaven, isn't that going to be glorious to know that everything is going to be perfect. Everything is going to be glorious and wonderful. We just get a little glimpse every once in a while of that perfection. Every once in a while we get a little glimpse of what is to come. So the manna stopped. The manna represents whatever is needed to sustain you. The manna represents what you need in that situation. It represents how, it represents how God intervenes and supplies our every need. How many times have you had your back against the wall? How many times have you run out of resources? How many times has the cupboard been bare? How many times has the gas tank been on empty? How many times have you wondered how you're going to make ends meet? But God made a way where there was no way. Not through your ingenuity, not through your ability or your talent, but God performed a miracle and he made a way where there was no way. Jesus provided for his disciples for three and a half years. He worked miracles. He healed the sick. He cast out devils. Wonderful things took place as he, they resided with him. When, when he, it was time to eat, he multiplied uh, the bread. He multiplied the fish to feed the multitude. When it came time to file their taxes, he told Peter where to fish out the money to pay the taxes. When the storm raged, Jesus simply said, peace, be still, and the storm ceased. That's the kind of God that we serve. Whatever your situation is, whether it's a monetary need, whether it's a physical need, whether it's an emotional need, whatever it is, God said he would supply every need according to his riches in glory. After the miracle of feeding the 5,000, Jesus said in John 6, 41, I am the bread or the manna which came down from heaven. So you see the symbolism of the Old Testament. You see the types and the shadows of the Old Testament. The manna that, uh, that they had in the wilderness was a symbol of the bread of life to come. The symbol of Jesus Christ. The rock in the wilderness was a symbol of Jesus Christ who is the rock of all ages. The rock that followed them was Christ. He was with them in the desert. He was with them in the storm of the sea needed to be divided he was there when they were thirsty he was there when they were hungry he was there when they were in need of healing he was there I want to tell you tonight he's still there he's Jehovah Shammah he's there with you always every day everywhere you go you can depend upon the Lord he'll never leave you he'll never forsake you hallelujah it's alright to say amen on Wednesday night you won't scare me at all the Lord wanted more for his disciples and more for those that followed him. He says in John 16 and 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Now, how devastating. I mean, Jesus had always been there. If they had a question, he was right there. They could ask him. If they had a, a burden, he was right there. They could tell him about it. If they had a problem, he was there. He had the solution. He was always there with them. But one day he said, I'm going away. Not only did he say, I'm going away. It's expedient that I go away. 
He said, it's necessary, it's important, it's vital, it's good for you that I go away. Because when Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Ghost came. The Holy Ghost was poured out. You see, the fact that the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost is evidence that Jesus Christ is on the right hand of the Father right now. It's evidence that he got back to the Father. And the disciples went out and they began to turn the world upside down as they were filled with the Spirit. If God stops the manna, it's because he's got something greater in store for you. When something dries up, when something runs out, when something stops, when the job ends, when difficulties come, you say, oh, what are we going to do? God is about to do something great. God's about to show you his glory. God's about to work something out for your good and for his glory. He'll make a way where there is no way. What you've depended upon, what you become to trust in, what you become to lean upon, sometimes he'll knock the props out from under you so that you'll not be so dependent, so that you won't feel so complacent, so that you'll say, Lord, I need you to intervene and he will once again make a way for you. He says in verse 12, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. How many of you know that nothing motivates us like food? Someone told me Sunday morning, they said, oh, when you got to talking about Chick-fil-A sandwiches, so we started getting hungry. And then when you mentioned Martha's meatloaf, said that really tipped the scales. But food motivates us. And when babies get hungry, Everybody in the house knows it. You've got to make sure the baby gets fed. Make sure daddy gets fed. Sometimes some folks can be turned into, turn into bears if they don't get fed. They need a Snickers bar so that they can change back. But God stopped the manna to keep Israel moving toward his purpose. He stopped the manna so they wouldn't come become settled down where they were. Sometimes we need a jolt. Sometimes we need a shock. Sometimes we need something to open our eyes and make us realize that this world is not our home. No matter how comfortable, no matter how convenient things have become, God wants us to know this world is not our home that our purpose here is not for our comfort, it's not for our own prosperity, it's not so we can say, look at me, he wants everybody looking at him. He wants everybody to see what he's doing. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. If the manna would have kept falling, it would have rendered them ineffective. They would have stayed, they would have, they would have put down their homes, their tents right there, they would have grown complacent and would have stayed contented right where they were. They would not have gone forward. They would not have driven out the Canaanites. They would not have possessed the promise. After all those 40 years, they would not have possessed the promised land that God had promised to their ancestors. They would not have possessed it. You know, that's where a lot of people are tonight. We're almost there. I mean, we're almost there. A song we used to sing coming up in the church, I can almost see the lights of the city. And when you look around and see what's going on in the world, you have to realize we're almost there. If, if the, we're not near the coming of the Lord, which I believe we are, we're, we're, we're closer to eternity than we've ever been. We're growing older every day. Our life on this earth is but a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. If you live to be 70, 80, 90, even 100 years, that's nothing compared to all eternity. So we're not going to stay here. There's a promise that he's given to us. A place where streets are gold, the walls of jasper, the gates are pearl. A place where there's no cemeteries, no funeral homes, no homes for the age. There's no one there that is crippled, no invalids are there. It's a glorious place. Oh, won't it be glorious when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be. So we don't want to get adjusted here. They would have failed to move forward and obtain the promise. So when the manna stopped, it forced them to move forward, to rout the cities and to claim the spoils. It motivated them to keep moving forward. You just can't stay in your tents, get up in the morning and there's manna falling. Everything's just being provided from heaven. God's doing this and doing that. 
He says in Hebrews 6 and 12, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Don't become lazy. The Lord rebuked the Laodiceans because they had become indifferent. They had become lukewarm. They had become complacent. They said, we don't have need of anything. But the Lord said, you don't know how wretched you are. You have need of everything. So whatever you do, don't stop. Whatever you do, don't stop. Keep climbing, keep praying, keep seeking, keep drawing nearer to the Lord. Whatever you do, don't stop. Jesus miraculously multiplied bread and fish and fed 5,000 people. It's a miracle. There was a need, and the Lord met that need at that time. It was not an everyday occurrence, not something you read about that happened every day. It was a particular time. Simon Peter, the Bible said, was, was miraculously freed from prison. How did he get out? Well, God sent an angel and brought him out of prison. Just the doors opened up of their own accord, and Peter came out of the prison. Didn't have to go by the warden, didn't have to have a petition to the governor, didn't have to say, uh, let's just get a protest going. God dispatched an angel, and the angel set him free from prison. So he went on down to the prayer meeting. Good place to go. Somebody gets out of jail. They ought to go to a prayer meeting. He went down to John Mark's house and knocked on the door. He had to knock on the door to get in to the prayer meeting. But this time, he didn't need an angel. He just needed somebody on the other side to open the door and to let him in. That's the way God operates. That's the way God works. That's the way God moves. All he needed was for somebody to come and open the door. God sends a miracle because human need necessitates it. He sends a miracle when the human need necessitates it. But there are other times when God gets us involved. Sometimes he lets us open the door. Sometimes he lets us do the things that need to be done. We can catch the fish, but he puts the coin in the fish. We can do our part, he'll do his part. But it's amazing how often God sends us just what we need when we need it. Just when you didn't think it was going to happen, he made it happen. When the Israelites were lost, God guided them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God provided that for them. He gave that to them for their protection. When they were thirsty for water, water just came gushing out of a rock or he just put an oasis right in the middle of the desert. When they were hungry, he sent manna. That's the way God works. When you have a need, God is ready to meet the need. He's ready to make a way where there is no way. I read the story of a woman who went to the drugstore one night to get some medicine for her sick daughter. She got there right at closing time, and she was the last customer. When she went out, the pharmacy, the, the, uh, the uh, clerk locked the door behind her, went on home. The woman got to her car, and to her horror, she realized she had locked her keys in the car. So what was she going to do? She prayed. She said, Lord, send somebody who can help me out of this predicament. About that time, there was a beat up old van that came pulling up in the pharmacy parking lot and the man got out and went to the door and he noticed it was locked and he went to get back in his van and the woman, she, she got a good look at him. He was unkept. He was dirty, he was unshaving, he was wearing a motorcycle gang jacket, he had a greasy bandana on his head and he didn't look like the knight in shining armor that she had hoped for and the man noticed her standing there beside her car with a pharmacy bag in her hand and he said, you okay lady? She thought to herself, God, is this who you sent to help me? And she explained her situation. I've got a sick daughter at home. She needs this medicine so desperately, but I've locked my keys in the car. Without saying a word, the man went to his van. He got a, a, a wire clothes hanger and he expertly twisted it with a hook on one end and he, and he put it down through the window or through the frame of the car and in just in a moment, he was able to pop the lock. And this woman was so relieved Tears filled her eyes, and she said, thank you very, very much. You're such a, a nice man. He said, lady, I'm not a nice man. Said, In fact, I just got out of prison for grand theft auto 
but you're welcome. He climbed back in his van and drove away. She got in the car, got behind the wheel, and she prayed another prayer. She said, thank you, God, for sending me a professional. You know, God knows who to send and when we need somebody. He'll work it out when you least expect, you know, from, from a way you didn't expect he would do it. That's the way God works. He'll make a way where there is no way. Sometimes we're looking over here and we think surely the answer's over here and God will send handfuls on purpose. He'll send something somewhere else where he'll make a way for the need to be met. How many times have you seen that happen? When one door closed, God opened another door. When you, when, when you got discouraging news and disappointing news, you found out that God had something better for you. So don't sit around and bemoan and cry and say, woe is me, it didn't work out. I don't know why God didn't do this for me because he knew that wasn't best for you. He knew that wasn't really what you needed even though you thought it was. Why, he's a lot wiser than we could ever be. He knows exactly what we need and when we need it. He will open up the door. He'll open up the window. He'll make a way. He'll work it out. He'll fix it. He'll solve it because he's that kind of a God. When the manna no longer fell on the ground, the crops of Canaan were available. When something, when one thing dries up, when one thing closes, one thing doesn't work out, don't worry when the manna stops because it just means that God is leading you into greener pastures. It just means God's got something else for you. He got more. He's got more for you to do. More rivers. They had more rivers to cross. They had more mountains to scale. They had more cities to overcome. They had more walls to fall. They had more captives to set free. They had more battles to be won. You know, this is an adventure that we're home. It's an exciting adventure. I don't want to get adjusted here. I just want to keep on overcoming the enemy. I want to keep on having victory after victory. I want to see what the Lord's going to do next. I want to see what God is doing. He doesn't operate on my schedule, my time schedule. He doesn't operate according to my calendar. He's already got a plan He's already got a purpose. He's already got his a will. And my prayer is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord. If the manna stops today, he's got something better tomorrow. He's got grapes. He's got pomegranates. He's got corn. He's got wheat. He's got everything we have need of. He will make a way for you. Would you stand with me, please? Oh, what a, what a day it must have been. When you're so used to something, something that's always been there, and all of a sudden it's gone. It's a shocking thing, but it's also a time to check our faith. Did we put all of our faith in the manna, or did we put it in the one who sent the manna? Have we put our trust in material things, in possessions, in our own abilities? Or are we still trusting in God? Because except the Lord builds the city, keeps the city, though that watch, watch but in vain. Except he builds the house, the labor but in vain. Except God is in control. Except he's doing the work. It will not come to pass. He has the final say, the final word. Doesn't matter what anybody else has said. Doesn't matter what anybody else has told you. God is still God. He's still sovereign. He's still over everything. Whatever's happening in your life tonight, whatever turmoil, whatever questions, whatever problems have arisen in your life, remember this one thing, that when the manna has stopped, when things change overnight, God's got something better something greater, something that he's working on in your life and through your life. What a testimony, what a story, what an encouragement, what a blessing you're going to be when you move into what God has promised to you. Would you come tonight? Let's find some time around the altar to pray and let's, let's take advantage of the privilege we have to serve God. Let's welcome his plan in our life tonight and say, Lord, I want your will to be done. Whatever your plan, whatever your purpose, here I am, God. I give it to you.
Yeah. 